Hello there, I'm Steve from Mac84, and welcome to the third video in my Vintage Macintosh Challenge series. To catch up on the previous two videos, you could click the little playlist link button thing over here, or you could find that same link in the video description text box. But essentially, I'm fixing up my Quadro 800 to prepare for some real work. The whole idea is to see what everyday tasks I can accomplish with the 68K based Mac, and to find out what is simply too slow or troublesome, and document my findings along the way. But there are some applications I think that'll work just fine. In the last video, I did a deep cleaning of this Quadro 800, and although it does still need some attention, I'm sure I could try and find some of those solutions that you guys mentioned in the comments and see if I can get some of those tough stains and spots out. Now I shot many, many hours of footage trying to get this system up and running, and you'll soon see why that is. So I'll be cutting to clips of those and likely to be doing some voiceovers because otherwise editing this would take forever and the resulting video would probably end up longer than some of my live streams. So after all, these are supposed to be vlog style videos without too much editing. So with that said, let's talk about my adventures in getting this machine to a working state. Now if I wanted to leave this Quadra 800 in its stock configuration, I could have done that and I could have easily got it running. Because this machine actually came to me with the original working 500 megabyte Quantum branded SCSI hard drive. It also had 16 megabytes of memory and an eMachines brand Nubus video card. So although it didn't have the optional CD-ROM drive, it did have an extra 8 megabytes of memory and a dedicated Nubus video card as well. Now, depending on this exact configuration and any sales promotions that may have been going on at the time, a machine like this would have sold for around 4,800 to 5,500 US dollars back in early 1993. That is expensive, but you also have to keep in mind that a 500 megabyte hard drive just alone went for about thousand dollars at the time. I was actually surprised that the original hard drive in this Mac still worked. It did have System 7.1 installed, as well as some graphic design applications like Suitcase, Cork Express, and Adobe Photoshop. So it's clear to see that this was in use as a graphic designer's computer. I could have left the system as is, but I was not going to pass up the juicy opportunity to push this hardware to its limits. Upgrading old computers is a lot of fun, especially because most of the time you can install upgrades and add-ons that you couldn't even dream of affording back in the day. I used to look at old Mac magazines and drool over CPU upgrades and add-on cards, but of course I could never afford them. Now, unfortunately today, a lot of eBay scalpers take a lot of fun out of this equation. Sadly, most people care more about making money than making sure these relics of the past find a good loving home. But thankfully, I have a sizable collection of old parts that I've accumulated over the past 20 years or so that makes this just a bit easier for myself. So let's get started with what I have. And don't worry, in the near future we'll be playing around with even more upgrades and add-ons. But for now, let's keep things a little bit simple. So let's talk about memory. The Quadra 800 has 8 megabytes of memory soldered onto the logic board, and 4 memory slots available to add more memory. How much more memory, you may ask? How about 128 megabytes of memory? Yeah, that's right, I'm not kidding. This thing could handle up to 136 megabytes of total memory. Pretty crazy, huh? While buying such a ludicrous amount of memory would have been insanely expensive back in the day, it'll only set us back about $20 or $30 today. I originally got together 96 megabytes of memory and installed it in this machine, which was fine, but why not max things out? I didn't have the extra memory, so I went ahead and ordered 32 megabyte modules for my Quadra 800, which we'll be installing shortly. I ordered four of these, which maxes it out at 136 megabytes of memory when you take into account the eight megabytes that are on board. Now, let's talk about the hard drive. Like most pre-PowerPC Macintoshes, this Quadra 800 uses a SCSI interface for its hard drive. This means that we can't simply use an IDE hard drive or a cheap compact flash adapter. We'll have to settle with spending some cash on a SCSI 2SD adapter. Like the name implies, it allows you to use an SD flash card as a SCSI hard drive, and it's the closest thing we could get to an SSD, even though flash memory is not an SSD in this case. I use my SCSI 2SD adapters all the time to help me restore and set up machines, and they are fantastic. I highly recommend getting one of these units if you're going to be spending any amount of time tinkering around with these machines. It really makes transferring files and booting up these old Macs much, much easier. An older working SCSI hard drive is getting harder and harder to find, and the prices for these things are getting a little bit silly. They're old and 20 and 30 years old, and they just are not expected to work as well as they used to. They're kind of like ticking time bombs. So if you have one that works, excellent. You could use that if you want, but an adapter like this makes it much more easier to do so. For my particular project, I'm going to be using a SCSI 2SD version 6. 
Now I've heard some talk that the version 6's speed advantages don't make a whole lot of sense on the Macintosh. However, in my experience, the version 6 of the SCSI 2 SD adapter is actually a little bit faster than the other versions. A friend of mine, Bruce, from the Brankers Creations YouTube channel, did a very awesome and in-depth testing and benchmarks video with his SCSI 2 SD devices, including the version 6. So go check out his video, it's linked in the video description, I'll put a button up there as well, to see for yourself the results of all these different SCSI 2 SD adapters, and how they compare to an actual quantum SCSI hard drive from back in the day. While the SCSI 2 SD adapter may not be as fast as a traditional hard drive in some areas, it actually excels in others. And before you ask, yes, I successfully backed up the original hard drive to a disk image, so we don't have to worry about losing any goodies that were on there. So let's talk about the video capabilities of this Quadra 800. It has two built-in video memory slots, so you could accommodate some video memory upgrades there. However, the machine also has three Nubus expansion slots, and since I have a lot of Nubus Macintosh computers, thankfully I have quite a selection of Nubus video cards to choose from. And I know some of these video cards make a lot of other users drool, so <laughs> we're going to be testing out some. In July, I picked up this Power Macintosh 7100, which actually had a Sonnet G3 upgrade card in it, and it also had this nice Super Mac video card. Seeing as the Super Mac video card was a bit newer than the eMachines one that came with the Quadra, I decided to swap it out just to see how it is. Now let's talk about the processor. The Quadra's 33MHz 68040 CPU is actually pretty quick. If I had a 601 PowerPC upgrade card, the machine could be even quicker, but honestly the first generation of Power Macs were kind of sluggish in some ways, so I'm not going to really be doing that. I don't have that upgrade, it's stupid expensive. Also, if I wanted to use a PowerPC, I'd use a PowerPC, but I want to use a 68K machine and just see where things take me. Now I do have a Quadra 840 AV that's just sitting here mocking me because I cannot get that logic board to work right now. And if I really wanted an additional 7 megahertz of speed, I could swap over that CPU and do some oscillator modifications, or I could get something like this Mac Clip Jr. and accelerate the Quadra a little bit. Now, I did see this thing, it was cheap enough on eBay, and it has some dip switches on there to handle some oscillator swapping for me. It could give me a modest speed bump, and who knows, maybe we could bump things even further down the road. So I did purchase this, and we will be taking a look at that later on when it arrives. But for now, we're just going to keep the stock CPU. Now I received a lot of feedback of what operating system to run on this thing. The original OS that came with this was Macintosh System 7.1. It could run all the way up to Mac OS 8.1 as well. I also got a fair share of comments and suggestions to try Linux on this system. While I do like Linux, I'm not a power user and I'm pretty helpless without a graphical user interface. I can get by with a nice GUI and something like Raspbian or Ubuntu or CentOS. But even then, once in a while I get myself into sticky situations with unsupported hardware or following directions where I get an unexpected result and I don't know how to continue. And while I'm sure running an older version of Linux or even compiling proper software packages for an older machine like this would even lead me to more of a headache than what I bargained for and what I have gotten myself into already. Besides that, these machines were designed to run the Mac OS, and it's what I'm most familiar with. Now I know it's not the same, but I might be curious enough to try Apple's AUX Unix system but maybe I'll start with that and see how adventurous I get. I know more Japanese than I know Linux, so I think I'm going to stick with the Mac OS for now. Sumimasen. I was curious though, because if I could dual boot this computer, why not triple boot it? System 7.1 came with this machine, so it would be the most responsive in most tasks. Too bad System 6 isn't supported, because I'm sure that would have flew on this hardware. While System 7.5 or 7.6 has more compatibility with games and multimedia programs, I would probably want that installed as well. And lastly, Mac OS 8.1 is the last OS supported by Apple for this computer. So I wanted to see how that actually performed under day-to-day -day tasks. Not to mention some of the newest applications would be available to me as long as they're not PowerPC only if I was running Mac OS 8.1. Now I would absolutely love to tell you that it was a joy to set up this machine and it was a breeze to get it up and running. But in reality, I lost over a week of time just battling this thing to get the operating systems installed correctly. Just ask my friends from MacYak. They had to put up with my constant ramblings while I pulled out what remained of my hair to try and get this darn thing to work. I won't bore you with the likely 24 plus hours of footage I shot for this thing, but let me tell you my pain and tell you what happened and then, well, how things sort of got resolved. The idea was to use the SCSI 2SD version 6 adapter and a 16 gigabyte SD card to set up four partitions, one for System 7.1, one for System 7.6, and one for Mac OS 8.1, and one for storage space. Now, there are some important things to keep in mind and some limitations. System 7.1 is limited to partition sizes of only 2GB, 
whereas system 7.5 and 7.6 are limited to partition sizes of 4 gigabytes. Technically, it could be a little more, but let's just stick with 4 gigabytes for now. Mac OS 8 fixes some of these issues and can take full advantage of more space, but you lose out on the capability of those older operating systems being able to see those partitions. So the idea was to set up an initial 1 or 2 gigabytes for system 7.1, 4 gigabytes for 7.6, and 4 gigabytes for Mac OS 8, and leave the rest as remaining storage in a partition or two. Either way, 1 gigabyte or more would have been plenty for any of these operating systems on their own. I mean, this system came with a 500 megabyte hard drive, so, you know, that's pretty stock, and that's double what it would have been. The original plan had me using three SCSI IDs, so with each system I had its own ID, which made it a bit easier to boot if things got sticky. Which, unfortunately, they did. When I first started, I didn't have too much trouble, but I was using my SCSI 2SD version 5.1, which is external. Now, when I switched over to the SCSI 2SD version 6, things initially seemed okay. I was able to format the disk with the Hard Disk Toolkit 1.8 version and install System 7.1 and Mac OS 8. But something with 7.6 really made my machine upset. This cost me days of doing anything useful because no matter what I tried, I had a problem. When I thought I had fixed one problem, another one appeared, and it just went on like this. I'm aware that I don't know everything about these old computers, and even though I've spent my life tinkering a lot with them, there's just something weird going on here, and I just couldn't fix it. Now, I know some people in hindsight, eagle-eyed guys out there will say, ah, oh, well, you should have done this, you should have done that, but please spare me, I think I've been through enough pain with this, and I think I've seen enough installer screen errors to last me a lifetime. I honestly never had this much trouble before. I've installed System 7.6 using these same install disks and images the same way and never had so much trouble. To make matters worse, System 7.1 and Mac OS 8 seem to work out fine. Only 7.6 gave me trouble. So what gives? Now I could have just decided to go with System 7.5.2 and just give up and maybe that would have worked but I was really keen on getting System 7.6.1 installed and up and running. It would usually install the system and things would appear fine but I'd reboot and get a sad Mac on a fresh install. Or it would decide to successfully install, but when I tried to upgrade to 7.6.1, it would come up with messages that simply didn't make any sense. And although I would follow its strange demands and hope that it would resolve the problem, eh, it would corrupt the system file, and yeah, it didn't really work. So there was really nothing I could do to make this happy. Now sometimes system 7.6 would seemingly install okay, but then I tried to install something like Open Transport 1.3, and the system would fail during the installation or freeze up. Now, this was beyond frustrating. Trust me, it's not what I like to be doing with these old machines. I like using them, not troubleshooting them. And this actually put a bad taste in my mouth to see if I actually wanted to continue using this system, because if it was giving me this much trouble while I was setting it up, I don't know what I was going to run into when I was actually using the darn thing. Thankfully, my friend Bruce gave me a tip and asked me to check the firmware of my SCSI 2SD version 6 adapter. Sure enough, I bought mine around January 2019, so my firmware was out of date. Now I updated the firmware, and nothing. My SCSI 2SD adapter seemed dead, and I thought, oh great, to add insult to injury, now this thing isn't working. But thankfully, after unplugging it and just letting it sit there for a while, when I plugged it back in, it was back in action. However, even with the new firmware, something was screwy. No matter what, System 7.6 did not want to install correctly, and it wouldn't stay correct for long if it actually did. I tried from CDs, from floppy disks, from disk images, copying system folders from one disk to another. Nothing seemed to want to make it happy. Remember, I've used these disk images before without a problem, so I had no idea what was going on here. So I went to bed and I woke up the next morning with an idea. How about I don't use the hard disk toolkit or Lido, and yeah, that worked on my other machines, so I don't know why, but instead, let's use that patched version of the Apple hard drive setup utility. Now this patched version of the Apple hard drive setup utility allows you to use this Apple utility to format hard drives that weren't shipped or supported and used by Apple. The interface here is not as straightforward as some of those other programs, but you can still customize the partition sizes and be specific about partition details here too. It just takes a bit of getting used to and some patience. So I erased my SD card and started fresh, after backing up my files of course, and I got to work on setting up those partitions. I first set up the System 7.1 partition, then 7.6, and then the 8 partition. Then I installed System 7.1 and performed its updates, and it worked out pretty well. It booted up fine, no complaints. So that was a win, and I never really had a problem with 7.1. It seemed to install okay. 
So then I installed system 7.6, and to my surprise that install actually completed successfully this time, and it rebooted right into the system and it seemed happy. So now I was going to install the system 7.6.1 update, which was giving me so much trouble before. Again, seemed like smooth sailing, so I was happy. But I forgot to install the control strip, and I know some people don't like it, but I got used to it and I wanted to install it. And I'm unsure why it's not installed by default on the easy install, so I decided to run the installer again and select the custom install and then select control strip. But since I was going from 7.6.1, that option wasn't there. I had to go back to the 7.6 disk image. So instead, to make my life easier, I just copied the control strip control panel and the control strip module folder from the system folder on another Mac just onto this computer to make it much easier. So I think after all the stress and hardship I've been through, I deserve a shortcut like this. Now onto the final test, open transport 1.3 and an Apple share client update I wanted to perform. These updates are required if you want to connect to a Mac OS 8, Mac OS 9, or Mac OS 10 computer on the network. Without these, I'd get an error about protocol failures or some unexpected connection issue when trying to connect to those newer systems. Now previously, I had some bad luck with this installation on my Macintosh 2SI. It simply was not allowing me to do this installation. But on other systems, and on other friends' systems, it installed fine. So I wasn't quite sure what the issue was. So of course, to my surprise, 2020 throws another curveball my way. And yeah, it throws up this error during the installation. It says it can't find the disk but it's installing from a folder, and that hasn't stopped this from working before on other systems. So again, I've used the same installation files before with no issues except on the Macintosh 2SI, but there was some problem going on here. And some people on the Macintosh Garden website had the same issue, so I knew I wasn't alone here. So I thought, maybe it was the startup disk. What if I could start up from another startup volume and maybe run the installation there? Now sadly, starting up from 7.1, it seemed to not work because when I tried to open the installer, it got confused with that larger than two gigabytes partition that system 7.6.1 was installed on. Because 7.1 can read it, but it can't write to it reliably. So the other thing I did was I started up from my Apple legacy recovery CD. And I thought, all right, let's try it this way. And nope, same problem. Now it kept complaining that it couldn't find disk one. So I thought, you know what? If it wants disks, I'm gonna give it disks. And so what I did was I made disk images out of those folders that it was complaining about, and I mounted those disk images. And yeah, apparently it didn't like that either. So I took it one step further and made actual floppy disks of the installation files. Now, these disks were actually the installer files that were copied from those folders, but on actual disks. And it still complained about it. I, I just don't know what was going on here. So I was about to give up hope when I realized, wait a second, I still have a Mac OS 7.6 installation on my external SCSI 2SD 5.1 adapter. Now, I'm still not used to the fact that I could have a whole Mac OS installation on an SD card and not some bulky SCSI hard drive or an external zip drive or something like that. So I booted from that external 7.6 partition, which was already updated 7.6.1 and already even had the OpenTransport 1.3 version installed. And I tried to launch the installer again and it worked. I, I don't know why it worked. You know, it was the same installation files. Maybe it just liked having system with the stuff already installed on it. And even though it was installing to another disk, I don't know, it magically worked. And at this point I was too relieved to ask questions or care about how this actually got itself to work. Now all that remained was to install Mac OS 8. I already had Mac OS 8 installed on my external SCSI 2SD adapter. So I copied over the system folder to the system 8 partition I had on the internal SCSI 2SD adapter. I named the partition system 8 because if I named it Mac OS 8, that caused conflicts during the installation. So guess how I figured that out? Fun times. Then I realized, oops, <laughs> this was actually a bare bones installation of Mac OS 8 that I was trying on that external SCSI 2SD adapter. And I copied over the folder to the internal one, it worked. So that was nice to prove that it actually functioned. So I did have that full installation backed up on my Mac mini running Leopard. So I was able to copy that back over to the SCSI 2SD and put that on the partition that I had created. Now, I made one stupid mistake here. I did try and trash the original system folder that I copied over from my external one, which had the bare bones installation, but I forgot to empty the trash. And yeah, that caused a big problem because the Mac was still booting from that system folder, even though it was in the trash. And since that system folder was in the trash, it was invisible, so I couldn't erase it. Yes, I could have tried rebuilding the desktop or erasing the partition, but I was so fed up with this, I was just like done at this point. So I plugged the SCSI 2SD adapter back into the Mac Mini 
and I tried to erase the unwanted system folder via the finder. And yeah, it said that the macOS system folder was in use on macOS 10. It, that makes no sense. I mean, how does this thing even... <sighs> so thankfully, I was able to use the terminal to forcefully erase the file, which actually felt very good. So take that, you cranky thing. I gotcha. So now with that unwanted system folder deleted, I went back to my Quadra 800 and booted up into System 7.6. I then blessed the macOS 8 system folder and rebooted the machine, and it successfully started up in macOS 8.1. I was very happy because I had hopefully nicked this problem, and now all my operating systems were installed, and this nightmare was over. Hopefully. Now I could actually use the machine and have fun with it, because up until now it's been kind of a pain. So I've decided to set this up on a desk downstairs. I may move it upstairs eventually, but you'll see why moving it might be a bit troublesome. So I set it up and I thought, okay, now I need a monitor. So I started to think about what monitor I wanted to pair with this computer. Of course, I have quite a few vintage Macintosh CRT monitors hanging around. Unfortunately, they are the older variety, so they're usually at a 640 by 480 resolution that is fixed, and I can't change that. So unless I wanted to be stuck with that, and that's really all I had. I do have some other monitors, but I don't think they would really suit my needs for this particular setup. And I thought, hmm, let's see, I have a few monitors that I have picked up recently. One I got from an e-waste facility, and I thought this would be a nice one to plug in. But when I plugged it in, it started to make some scary noises, so I quickly unplugged that and put it back on the shelf. Then I thought, wait a second, when I went to rescue that G3 all-in-one system, I got a few Sony Trinitron monitors. And one of those was in pretty good condition, except for a little cosmetic damage on the back. So I plugged that in and, oh boy, was I satisfied with this choice. I feel like I'm front row at a movie theater where the screen is just so big and you're just like looking up at it. I mean, <laughs> this thing is crazy. The resolution is, is great. I mean, this thing is beautiful. This is running System 7.1. I mean, I'll get some close-ups later, but... This thing is, is just pin sharp. The colors are beautiful. I mean, yeah, it's a Trinitron, but boy, what a Trinitron. This is fantastic. Oh man, let's let's try uh, let's try something that every CRT needs to be graced with at some point or another. <laughs> Look at those toasters fly. This is fantastic. Yeah, I need to clean up the screen a little bit, and we'll do that uh, in a in a short while, but. <laughs> this is just great. One problem I did still have was that the battery holder on the logic board was kind of broken. The rust from the previous leaking battery caused one terminal to fall off. So I decided to remove the entire battery holder and replace it with a new one. This didn't take too long, and since the replacement part was very similar, I don't think anybody would really notice the difference. Now we just have to put in a fresh battery. <laughs> uh, no, we won't be doing that. Although, I did have a problem as my newest PRAM battery was already dead. So, as a quick fix, I just soldered a AA battery terminal to the back and put in some fresh AA batteries. I know the voltage isn't exact here, but it's good enough just to keep the monitor resolution and other settings saved between shutdowns. This is only a temporary solution, and I will remove these cables once I get a new battery. So now we get to the fun part. We actually get to play around with this machine. So in the next video, we're going to be talking a lot about upgrades and cards and... Oh boy. I can't wait to do a lot of fun things with this machine. And I don't know what I'm really going to put in there or what upgrades I'm going to try. But I'm going to try a bit of everything. We have some stuff from eBay that's coming. So please stay tuned. I think it's going to be a lot, a lot of fun. I've been waiting a long time to get into this state. And I'm not sure exactly what upgrades and software and stuff are going to be putting on there just yet. I am going to be playing around with getting email, web browsing, and possibly some chat room stuff working, so be sure to stay tuned for my next video in this series when we explore some more software and other things that I'm going to set up on this machine. Of course, if you have any ideas of period-appropriate software or hardware that you'd love to see, put it in the comments box below, and I'll be sure to take a look at it. Of course, it requires that I have some of this hardware or software lying around, but I just may, so you never know. But that's about it for this video. I hope you are enjoying following my Vintage Macintosh Challenge. It has certainly been a bit of a challenge so far, but I think this is going to be a lot of fun in the end. And if you like these sorts of videos, please consider subscribing to my YouTube channel. And don't forget to like the video. It helps us grow. Don't forget, you can follow me on Instagram and Twitter. My handle is Mac84TV. And if you want to support me on Patreon, you can do that as well. You can get instant access and early access to videos like this before they go public. You also get discounted merchandise and other cool stuff. So for as little as a dollar a month on Patreon, you could support me and help this channel grow. 
So just go to patreon.com slash Mac84 to support me there. But that's it for now. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you here right here next time on Mac84.